Welcome to the broadcast, my dears. I'm going to respond to a viewer by the name of Dinky Smudge. Dinky Smudge wasn't the only one who wrote addressing this issue, but Dinky Smudge was one of the few that addressed it in a very besmirching manner and a style of which I was not fond. But I will enjoy responding to you, Dinky Smudge. Did you know, says Dinky Smudge, that your precious prince and princess lied to the British public? It has been revealed all over Twitter that they lied about fundraising for a mental health charity. They wanted all the glory and said they donated £345,000 to the Two Ridings Community Foundation. But, big but, Dinky Smudge tells us all in capital letters, underlined, big but. Their financial report has been unearthed for 2023 and shows that they only donated £13,000. Perhaps you would love to explain exactly why they thought it was okay to blatantly lie. They will not live this one down. The accusations are flying all over social media. It's a disgrace and you don't have the nerve to call them out, do you? And this is rich. King Harry and Queen Meghan would never stoop so low. <laughs> Dinky smudge. Dinky Smudge is one of a roster of morons. Morons. And I've got to say they appear on both sides of the lollipop, not just the Sussex side, but one of a festering fungus of morons who cannot discern from A to B, from the sky is blue to the grass is green, from black to white. They exist in some petrified limbo where nobody would ever dare to tread. A lot of this is based around, and I do want to clear this up because after I received these comments, I took a peek. I don't engage in social media. But I took a peek to see what was going on and it was all over the place. All these besmirchments about Catherine and William making claims that they don't live up to. No, no. So as usual, it's left to me to clear up this muck. On the 3rd of November, last November, this was, 2022, a tweet went out from the Prince and Princess of Wales. So, so pleased. And why they have to say so twice, I don't know. We don't need all these superlatives. Catherine and William, come on now. So, so pleased to announce. No, we are so pleased to announce. They're dropping, dropping standards. That, uh, that's not for now. So, so pleased to announce 345 uh, K of funding from the Royal Foundation and two ridings. Well, one riding would be enough when it comes to our big willy, but I digress. Two ridings CF, the Community Foundation, leaving a lasting legacy of support for young people's mental health here in Scarborough. Well, first of all, the devil's in the detail, my dear. It does actually say in this little Twitter, and presumably on Twitter you're only allocated a small spot to say what you've got to say anyway. It does state even in that tiny little post that the funding is coming from two elements, or was arranged by two sources, the Royal Foundation and Two Ridings Community Foundation. That's to begin with. But then, uh, to travel onwards, you look at the Royal Foundation website, you look at the press release from that very day, which was issued to media worldwide, to global media, which is full of transparency, full of the truth, and no hidings. The press announcement, all public materials. The funding is the result of generous donations from local individuals and organisations keen to make a difference. It says that uh, same proposal, different wording on the statements, on the website. It's all there for everybody to read. and. It is their patronages, it is their involvement in the charities that helps attract the publicity and incentivizes and invigorates people to add and contribute to funds, funds, uh, and not necessarily donations. 
And incidentally, when I was looking over this report myself, it says the total charitable grants and donations are actually up by £1 million for the Royal Foundation in one year. Yes, they've gone up a million. The vast majority goes to Earthshot, as one would expect. That's their passion project, with millions going to Earthshot prizes. But the Royal Foundation is a foundation, not it's not a philanthropic enterprise in that pure sense of philanthropy, my dear. This is the royal family. I am so sorry, dinky smudge. Not sorry, but the day of exposure for Catherine and William is, is never going to come, my dear. You can keep hammering on, but their copy will not blot. You're not going to be seeing that, my dear. Their conscience is clear. Their conscience is clear. I mean, she's too pure to be pink, the girl. But as for Big Willie, uh, you know. He's never going to slip on your banana. Also, the report patently states, or rather the press releases or whatever, they patently state that the funding will be divided between the local organisations over the long term. This is a long term thing to increase the help they can provide. And the clue, by the way, is in the header of number eight on the report, which says an analysis of grants and donations. At the bottom, it says, unless otherwise stated, all amounts are for single grants. Well, nothing is otherwise stated next to this particular entry. So what does that mean, dinky smudge? What it means is that, as it says, it is a single grant, not a donation. Not a donation. So get your facts and figures in order before you file them. The clue is in the word fund. Fund. Look it up. And by the way, fund is a marvellous word, one of my favourite. And people don't tend to use it in its fullness these days. You can have a, a fund of benevolence, a fund of hope, uh, you know, a fund of men. <laughs> Whatever you want, my dear. It doesn't have to be purely financial, and it's a pity. So I'd like to encourage you to use that wonderful word in various other kinds of contexts, because it's a shame to have it hanging there in the library without its uh, other usages. The Prince and Princess of Wales are speaking about their establishing and their arranging together with this other community enterprise of a fund, and one that will be long-term and hopefully the gift that keeps on giving, and they're giving it a good old kick up the backside to get it going, my dear. That's what royalty's about. That's what royalty's about. And it drives them insane, doesn't it? The dinky smudges of the world. Driving them insane that they just cannot. They cannot drum up any dirt on these two. No. And it's never going to happen. The, the only thing they were clutching at was Giles Coram and his Rose Hambry fable. <laughs> that fable. And by the way, in case there are a few stragglers of doubters that ever believed anything about the Rose Hambry story, even though Coran has denied it a million times over. He was at it again a couple of weeks ago when he got in trouble for something on Twitter and people were haranguing him about making stuff up about Catherine and William. Well, he said he, he reposted on Twitter an explanation of the fact that he was basically, I think, tipsy in a cab somewhere and made up the whole tale just as a joke, a little joke, and didn't know that it would go viral on Twitter. He just popped it out of thin air, darling, and you've still got all these... Uh, Harkalina admirers world over going on about a story that doesn't exist when you see the Hambrys, the Chumleys, uh, all over the coronation hanging out with William and Catherine all the time. I mean, it takes an absolute, someone insane in the membrane, dear, to believe any of this hideousness. But of course, there are those that are insane in the membrane, not accusing you, dinky smudge, but you obviously haven't got things worked out. There's nothing shady about these two, nothing. But Lady Glen Connor, our dear friend Lady Glen Connor, who was a very close bestie of Princess Margaret Rose's and knew the Queen, the Queen rather well as well, the late Queen Elizabeth, and grew up together with them. She's 90 now, 91 years old, but she's been speaking out yet again. She's been speaking out. She was on a podcast with the King and Queen's bestie. <laughs> they're all besties with everyone these days, aren't they, my dear? But you know, they're, they're associates, shall we say, Giles Brandreth. Well, he hosted a podcast, his podcast, The Rosebud, 
on Apple. You can go and listen yourself. And he had uh, Anne Glenn Connor on. And uh, she spoke of Meghan because an audience member asked her, what are you making about all this Sussex nonsense? And she said that, you know, she knew Harry when he was young, that he was a delightful enough child. And she seemed to sympathise more with him, with the boy. But when it came to Meghan, she said, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, well, she said, I think the thing about Meghan is that she had no idea what was expected of her, really. I think she just thought it was like being a, another actress, you know, riding around in a golden coach or carriage and everything like that. Well, I would beg to differ a little with Anglin and Collar. I mean, I understand what she says. She doesn't really care about the golden coaches, though. She wants the luxurious design of togs and, you know, this kind of thing, and that's fine. But, you know, you don't commercialise when you're a royal. You don't commercialise a merchandise. You don't turn into gazillionaires when you're, you're a Duchess of Sussex. You don't have that opportunity if you uh, have undertaken the role of a working royal. And she was never forced or coerced into that, by the way. That was of her own volition. And then, yes, that's when she decided that it wasn't really her cup of tea because she saw herself as a, an activist in Kashmir and fur and dance. Fake fur, of course, for her. The ever least. That uh, yeah. She said, and generally speaking, being, being a member of the royal family, because she said that, you know, she accompanied uh, Princess Margaret Rose, for example, as lady in waiting for 30 years past. She said, a lot of it is extremely boring, as we know. Too boring for Harry and Meghan. And I can understand that it might be boring. I mean, let's put it in perspective. Let's not start playing the violins for royalty. Yes, it is hella boring, the lot of it they get up to, but do they want to trade it in for a 30-year shift on the tills at Tesco's, my dear? Or the night shift as a hospital porter? Or, you know, any number of jobs, any job. And trot out for your lunchtime, you know, your lunchtime treat at the Pret, the local pret a manger Hey, you know, a little sandwich meal deal, what's going on over there. And commuting home, taking two hours on the train at a cost of several thousand pounds per year. You know, let's not get the violins out for royalty because the job's boring. But the fact is, if they thought it was boring, well, Harry knew what he was up for. He'd been in the firm all that time. And he should have skedaddled and taken the wife off to America or wherever they want to go beforehand, in advance of the wedding. But why couldn't he? Because he knew that he would be receiving a certain wedding gift, didn't he? The dukedom. The dukedom. If you'd have skedaddled beforehand, my lovers, then he would be plain old Prince Harry and she would not be titled in the same manner. So they had to stick around for that. They had to stick around for that and pretend and pretend like they were going to be uh, somewhat compliant and toe the line. But of course they weren't going to do it for Big Willie. <laughs> Not when little Todger's there. Not when he's around. Oh, no, no, no. No, they bid their time, didn't they? They bided their time. And Glenn Collard tells us that at the coronation, she was sat next to John Kerry, the American uh, politician boy. And she asked him what America thinks of Meghan and Harry. Well, of course. He told her, we all feel very, very sorry for Harry. <laughs> oh, dinky smudge. Isn't that bitter to your ears? America feels extremely sorry for Harry. Well, I don't feel sorry for Harry, I'm afraid. He brought it all on himself. And anyway, he looks as if he's having a blast anyway these days. So I'm sure he's not regretting an ounce of it. I know many of you like to think that he looks like he's uh, a broken man and he looks hideously unhappy and all that. I, I see the same Harry I always saw, to be honest. It depends when the photograph captures him. I mean, I can look ruddy miserable while I'm having a blissed out time. And uh, I can look absolutely elated and full of gaiety when I'm dying inside. Anyway, Prince Harry has been in Texas, so I have many Texan fruits, or should I say, 
The blue roses of Texas I have many that watch this broadcast. Watch out my lovers because he's over there. Did you know that Texas is equal to almost three United Kingdoms in size? Just to put in perspective. Yes, all four nations of this one kingdom uh, will go into Texas almost three times. There are 11 states in the USA that are larger than the than Britain. He was at the Austin Formula One Grand Prix as a guest of Team Mercedes, whatever that means, and the Duchess was not in attendance. It was boys and their toys. He was with various executives who wouldn't normally be seen dead with the boy if the word Prince wasn't attached to the name Harry. He was hanging out with Christian Horner, Ginger Spice's hubby. From the bottle died Ginger of Jerry Harriwell to the real thing, although he's not so much Ginger these days, as slightly, what shall we say, cinnamon and salt. Uh, regardless, it was a case of when two become one. And as usual, there was a chic lineup of semi elegant gentlemen. I wouldn't exactly say they were the most elegant gentleman in the world, but semi elegant, semi chic, bookended by this outlandish fuzzy dandelion affair at the end. He always looks as if he skipped double maths and is playing truant for the day, doesn't he, my dear, like some edit schoolboy, until you take a peek under the cap and then realise that you've got some middle-aged affair going on, some flustered middle-aged affair looking extremely out of place and like he doesn't really belong, but having a wonderful time. If Harry's happy, I'm happy. Then just don't, don't place misery onto your family members and onto our nation, my dear. But you know, if he's having a good time, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Who wouldn't be? His stepmother was having a wonderful time as well. Queen Camilla was in Berkshire and Her Majesty arrived at Ascot for the races. She wore a green dress coat and hat with knee highs and her diamond studded horse and jockey brooch, which was seen before. A gift received by the late Queen Elizabeth, in fact, on her 90th birthday. The Queen's hat was embellished with curlicues and the royal hands were gloved in black leather. Lovely. She was present for the unveiling of a tribute to Frankie de Tory, who I cannot stand, but it's got to be done. And she posed with photographs to the delight of the crowd. I had a few comments and questions asking for my verdict on the King's speech last week that he gave at Mansion House, which was very well received in the press by most quarters. Not all, but by most. And I have a problem with some of it. It was a heartwarming speech, it was very well received, it won hearts and it won a few minds. It was very personal, or professed to be, no, but I did believe that it was very personal to the King. It was emotional at times, he spoke of love. He spoke of love, it was underpinned by ideas of decency and virtues for all seasons, which is very attractive coming from the royal family. It puts one in mind of the late Queen, her decency her devotion to goodwill, he did the job as an avuncular, unifying figure. He's got that sort of uh, grandpapa effect going on, hasn't he, that people rather warm to. And we saw it immediately that the late Queen died, when he was out there meeting crowds and shaking hands. All of a sudden he went from, oh, Prince Charles, which most of the populace, was sort of rather indifferent towards, or sometimes even a little bit spiteful to. He went from that sort of figure to a sort of avuncular or grandfatherish figure overnight, didn't he? Which I rather loved. You know, we then witnessed the birth of King Cosy Socks, my invention. And uh, the sentiments are all good on this speech. You have to go and read it or watch it if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about. It was. A, all, all through the news. But his summary of the United Kingdom as a community of communities, which isn't the first time this phrase has been used, by the way, might have sounded poetic to some. To me, it sounded rather twee. Uh, a community of communities, an island nation in which our shared values are the force which holds us together. <laughs> Don't pee on my leg. Bonnie, King Charlie, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. 
Our shared values are the force which holds us together. No, this did not ring true with me, I'm very sad to tell you, my dear. A hundred years ago? Yes. A hundred years ago? Absolutely. Fifty years? Mm -mm. Today? No. Nah. No. Nah. This nation is on the outs. There were shared values. Pre-unmitigated immigration. And I'm talking about unmitigated recent immigration, recent decades. There were shared values when there was a shared faith. Principles based, based on a shared faith. And there was a national identity. And there are noble values and less desirable ones that aren't so valuable found in most faiths. It's not certainly not exclusive to the Christian faith, you know, the one that is traditionally associated with these shores, and in most national identities, but they are not shared. They are not shared values. They might chime together on certain ones that they can all agree on, you know, peace and love for all and all this, that and forth. But cultures that are historically totally alien to ours in this kingdom have evolved with their own values. And I'm not here to say that those values from other cultures are any better or any worse than ours, by the way. It's not about who's done it best, who's come up with the best invention, but those values may be less virtuous or more, more virtuous than ours, or a mixture of better, worse, and entirely incomparable. But they are not shared. Don't tell me they're shared, my dear. And I absolutely understand and accept that a lot of what we're seeing now, and I don't have to tell you, you can see it out there in re recent years, but also in recent days. You know what's going on. And you know, well, I understand there is a karma to us as British people of imposing our values on other nations. During the time of empire, there is a, a karmic echo that resounds and reverberates after that. So I understand that and I accept it. Even though I make no apologies for the people of empire, the people of empires that came before the British empire, because there were many and could go on to be many more if the world survives past 2023. We are living in an age not of shared values, but of split values, divided, as seen all over the Anglosphere in particular, or I should say the Anglospheric West. And it shows up as traditional understanding versus woke ideology, for want of a better terminology for it, you know. I'm using the word, but you all know what I'm pointing at when I say that. But traditional versus a new woke understanding that's been ushered in, or should I say misunderstanding. It is taken stranglehold to parts of society like a boa constrictor around the neck. Like a boa constrictor, taken hold, a stranglehold of people, institutions, firms, politicians, the corrupted, the corruptible. And by the way, what's going on can work and could have worked if we were speaking about moderate nations with moderate attitudes in moderate numbers, then people can rub along rather well together. Not everybody is moderate. Not everybody is like the people that inhabit the lives that most of you and I know in our cosmopolitan multicultural cities where we all rub along and absolutely adore each other and love each other and are totally accepting and don't want to change anyone or their culture or their loves or their faiths. You know, moderates. That's one thing. But when you are open doors for decades to 
the swarming hundreds of thousands of any number of very different, very alien cultures and philosophies and worldviews and faiths, then that is quite a different question, my dear. It's also stupid. And it was also seen coming by many of us, but nobody stood up for us. Least of all, this Tory government for the last 13 years who did nothing about it. But I understand that the king in his role had to project optimism. He was optimistic, encouraging, and he set the tone for his first Christmas broadcast, didn't he? Which is coming up in two months time. That'd be something. So I understand the predicament he's in. I don't know how much of what he says he actually believes in this about the community of communities because he's painting a picture that sort of implies it's oh lots of lovely little convivial congenial little parishes around the kingdom that are different but the same and can all rub along. No my dear what we're seeing now is insular ghettos up and down the land within cities within country dwellings within various hotels and accommodation throughout the kingdom. Tragedy. Absolute tragedy. And I'm quite sure that he must know it. Some part of him must know it. Of course he can't say that. Of course. He can't just say, can he? That it's all just shit. It's all going to shit, my dears. It's all going down the swanee, because that's exactly where it's headed, my dear. My dear old swanee. Well, I actually made my notes for this a few days ago when it happened. But since then, in fact, I think it was this morning, Trevor Phillips published a piece in the Times uh, which echoed quite a few of my own thoughts. He said, the pluralism of liberal democracy is wilting in the face of the resurgence of these ancient loyalties all over the world. Liberals like me spent the second half of the 20th century imagining a future in which people would be freed of their communal history and judged by the content of their character. Instead, we find ourselves contemplating a reality in which too many people are imprisoned by the content of their past. Deeply disturbed he was, Trevor Phillips, by all this community of communities talk. He thought it was rather sinister. He loves the king. He says that the king means well. Uh, and he says that, ironically, the king's verbal encouragement of division between his subjects is completely contradicted by his life's work. His charities have been some of the most effective engines of racial integration and equality in our nation. Hear, hear. And it's a pity that the monarch's advisers have led him into treacherous waters that threaten to undo the good that has taken him more than 50 years to create. Queen Camilla was wearing Bruce Oldfield, old Brucey O, the same gown that she wore to Berlin, so nothing new I'm afraid there, but nice to see it getting another airing. I actually rather approved of her wearing the same thing, that's quite a nice idea, it shows nothing too wasteful too extravagant but then again she is a queen what I didn't really enjoy was seeing it in the same year she could have waited a few years and then it would have been quite remarkable if she took it off the pig again a few years down the line if she's still alive but uh, two airings in one year mm, bit of a waste there but at least we got to see some new jewels new jewels the girls of Great Britain and Ireland tiara which was a wedding gift for the late Queen Elizabeth and it features a festoon and fleur de lis designs. Originally, it was studded with 14 pearls, but it was eventually replaced with 13 diamond brilliants. The pearls, in fact, went to the lover's knot, and Her Majesty treated us to a glimpse of the South African diamonds, presented in 1947. To Princess Elizabeth on her royal visit during her birthday celebrations there, she was presented these diamonds from the Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa, a diamond and platinum necklace, and it's something very special. And those who were present say that she audibly gasped in shock when she took those diamonds for her own. And she actually went on to call them my best diamonds. So they certainly got the royal seal of approval. 21 graduated brilliant diamonds with additional round and baguette diamonds between each larger brilliant and in 1952, the piece was shortened and the excess was used to create a matching bracelet for the full parole.
Well, I can't dress it up, my dear. It's all doom and gloom, isn't it? It's all doom and gloom out there, my dear old fruits. What can you say? You do have to reach into that reservoir, that well of humour, to get through it all, my dear. But it's not encouraging. London Bridge has fallen. London is falling. The kingdom is disintegrating before our eyes. I do believe that the royal family are one of the few things that uh, are left trying to re-erect the scaffolding. But the king, as well as the other members of the royal family, have really got to watch their step and it's an almost impossible job to do it. But if anyone is equipped and furnished to do it, it is them. I do still believe that. I wouldn't still be here singing their praises most of the time. Uh, or criticising where criticism is needed because it's not helpful just to be purely sycophantic. We have to uh, keep an eye on them and uh, look after them in return to the way that they look after us, you know. But steal yourselves, my dear, steal yourselves. Always remember that you have it within your power to stay royal and channel the royal spirit at all times, no matter what you're going through, whether you're gay, whether you're miserable, dejected or joyful, or whether you are sucking the fuzzy end of the lollipop, my dear. It is always within your remit and your reach to channel the royal spirit. So do it. Do it for Queen Alexandra. Do it for Queen Mary. Channel that royal spirit, my dear. Stay fruity and always on royal duty. Toodle pet.